I'm Stan Boyle. I am a uh, founding member of Spectrum Theater, and we welcome you back to the Neurodiversity Matters Conference with Spectrum Theater. Uh, today, at this time, we are having an interview with Jesse Helfring from the Summit School in Montreal, Canada. So welcome, Jesse. It's nice to have well, you. Thank you very much, Stan. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we will have um, this is being broadcast live on Facebook, so we will open this up for if anyone has any questions to post them on Facebook and we will try to get them out and ask them to Jesse. But first we'd like to have Jesse kind of discuss what the Summit School does, what your what your programs are in that. And Fantastic. then we'll go into questions. Wonderful. Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to say just a, you know, a thanks, Dan, to you and Clay and everybody and Anna that I've uh, dealt with so far. It's been great. And what you guys, the Spectrum Theater Ensemble, are doing here, I just think it's wonderful because it's one of the main foundations of what we're trying to do also, which is to kind of create connections um, across Canada, across North America, um, you know, with, within organizations that, are, that have this sort of similar mandate, which is to use theater to kind of um, sort of open up the audience's minds, um, you know, introduce different types of uh, you know, introduce neurodiversity and all of its uh, wonder and, and, you know, the struggles and everything. Um, so this is great. Um, so I, I'm really, really excited and happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Um, we appreciate that. Wonderful. And so basically, I just, you know, Summit School is a school in Montreal. It's a kind of unique um, school where we have over 650 students. All the students at our school have developmental disabilities. Um, the students range in age from 5 to 21. Uh, the about 50% of our student population um, is on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that means that 50%, there, there are other developmental disabilities and there's a, a, a big sort of um, social community of many different, you know, individuals with different types of, of um, sort of, you know, ways of expressing and ways of, you know, of being. So in that way, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. There's, and there's sort of a different way of structuring education for each of those groups. Um, I started at the school uh, about 12 years ago. My background is in theater and film and, um, and uh, in English. Um, I have a degree in uh, English literature. Um, so when I came on board, they, you know, we, um, there was sort of a need right away. I, I just saw right away that there were students that, um, that, that had the ability to express uh, theatrically, that wanted to be on stage, um, but there, there was no real program for them. So we just started to develop that program. Um, we had wonderful support from the community. Um, and each year we, we put on a show or every year and a half and, and it just grew and grew. All of the shows that I do are original content. So they are created with the students in some capacity. The way that we sort of get content from the students has changed, uh, or, you know, changes and evolves every time because it's a it's sort of a learning flow. Um, but I just wanted to give a few examples of some of the shows that we've put up. So uh, our first sort of big show that that went beyond the school community was called uh, Rachel at Risk, and that was a show um, that was based on um, interviews over six months with over 50 different students with developmental disabilities. And I videotaped those interviews and we used that, you know, we talked to them about everything, about, you know, their viewpoint on life, what they wanted the world to know about them, um, what frustrated them about the world, what frustrated them about their schooling, what, you know, what, you know, and what, what were the positives and, you know, and all of that. And, you know, we got a sense that they really had a lot to express in terms of you know, ideas about what they wanted to say. This is around 2012 that we did this. Um, and so we, I kind of, I then took all of that. So I'm, a, you know, a writer and a theatrical person. I took that and I kind of used their, the, the uh, transcripts of those interviews to create a play. Um, and so that play, Rachel at Risk, um, was put on and, um, you know, it sold out. It was a huge, wonderful reaction. Um, and it was very scary because it was the first time that I um, did a, a show where there was so much memorizing. So these students had a, a ton to do. And the thing about our school is that um, the students that, that come, they, they all have sort of intellectual um, impairments. So, you know, 
there's a lot of different ways of categorizing that by IQ or whatever. A lot of that's, you know, so controversial and meaningless, but the fundamental is they do really struggle with learning. And so a lot of our guys would really not be able to get a regular high school leaving diploma. Some of them um, never really end up learning how to read. So we have all sorts of levels of, of intellectual capability. And so putting on a play like that, you know, there were a fair number of people saying, you know, the students may not be able to do that. But, you know, we, we learn different ways of rehearsing and a different approach to how to, how to memorize and a lot of repetition. And it was just an incredible, you know, wonderful success. And from there, again, it, it grew. We did another play um, called Out of Here um, a couple of years later. And that one was a musical that was about the, the basic storyline was five students from our school and the school went downtown Montreal to this outing at a library at a museum and five of these students escaped and they kind of had their Ferris Bueller's day off kind of scenario running through the city doing things they've always wanted to do but it also gave an opportunity in a fun sort of musical way to look at some of the challenges that they face in regular society the way that they're sort of miss miss um misrepresented and mis with the way often some of their actions um, and behaviors are misinterpreted. Um, and so it gave us a way to play with that that was sort of uplifting and fun. And also at the end, very heartfelt and emotional. That play ended up going to the Centaur Theater. So we put it up and then we were asked to go to the Centaur, which is one of the biggest theaters here in Montreal. Um, and that was an incredible experience because you've got to imagine these, these young people who don't get to do a lot of different things and now they're on one of the biggest stages in Montreal with a packed house of regular theater goers. And, and those theater goers, they, they, I know the way they, the mentality when they arrive is, oh, this is gonna be nice. It's a school play, it's gonna be cute. They were in tears, they were laughing. They were like, one of them said, this is like the best thing I've seen at this theater all year. So we've been able to build and work off of that. And, um, you know, and, and the thing is, it's one of these things, I'm just gonna do a side comment here where I know it's annoying, right? It's annoying that when someone with a disability does something that quote unquote neurotypical people can do, we're supposed to applaud because that's amazing. And the thing is, these guys have talents and abilities that are inside them that are, that are incredible, that have their own unique sort of flavor that uh, we're bringing things to the stage that no one had really ever seen before. So we're not just talking about doing something that is the same as another group or equivalent. We're actually doing something that's opening up a new way and not just a new way of um, not just a new way in terms of the content and who the actors are, but a new way of performing, a new way of being on stage and just the movements are different. And, and all of that is, is, is interesting if it's put into the right context and surrounded by the, the right um, sort of setting and, and concentrated sort of thought by all of the people that are helping to put it up. So before we go to the last uh, the, the questions. I just wanted to say one other show that I wanted to talk about was the one we just recently finished. And it was called Letter, it was called Letter to My Disability. And the way this show came about, and I'm highlighting this to kind of show you the different ways shows are made at the school. Um, this show, there was this teacher that for 15 years, she sort of had the higher functioning group. I, again, I, I hate these words and, and, you know, but that's, the, the, the kids that were the most academically capable, um, when they turned around 14, 15, they would have this health class with her. And she, one of the modules in the health class was disabilities. And they talked about disabilities that the students themselves had. And in some cases, this was one of the first sort of moments where these students actually began discussing their own disabilities or confronting them. And it was sort of controversial because in some cases, the parents had not really talked a lot about those issues with them. Yet all of the kids kind of knew we, um, we were, uh, they, they, all of these kids kind of knew that, um, that, they, that there was something that was different about them. And so the teacher then asked them to write a letter to their disability and they were able to use whatever words that they wanted, whatever language. And she basically handed me a stack of 40 letters and I just read them and it was like these pure expressions of, of anger, frustration, of beautiful creative writing, of joy, of hope. It was just in these letters to themselves almost 
and, and I was like, oh my God. So we put up a show that surrounded that, which was kind of a narrative about a teacher trying to draw this out of her students. But the letters that we used in the show were real letters written by the students. And again, that one was picked up and put on our another huge stage here, the Siegel Center. Um, and again, sold out performances and a lot of success and a lot of desire for people to, hey, can you put this show up again? And, and um, you know, it's hard because it's a school, but so that's sort of where we're at, you know, and, and now we're sort of a bit, as everybody else is in the theater community, a bit derailed um, here because of COVID and, uh, and the future of, of what performance might mean over the next two, two years. So we haven't really started wrapping our head around that, but, you know, so that's kind of where we're at. And the school, the whole time, you know, this is done from a school um, that has just supported us and, you know, every step of the way they've helped us um, to realize these goals and not all our goals are academic goals. Mm -hmm. And that's been the wonderful thing is that it's, it's really seen as a, as sort of an emo, uh, a self confidence building, um, but also community building, uh, sort of, um, you know, lots of different, you know, benefits to the program that might just kind of go beyond your straight up reading, writing and arithmetic. So I'm just always happy and, and thankful to Summit School for allowing us a program like this to exist and grow and evolve. Right. But I think that's that's kind of my intro <laughs> to what we do. Thank you. That's. Uh, let me just say personally, as a member of Spectrum Theater Ensemble, your experiences are. You know, you the the background of your experience is different, but you have said so many of the same things we've discovered as as a theater company. Well, here in Rhode Island, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, great. that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, then that's one of the reasons I wanted, I, cause I've also, the, the thing, it goes both ways a bit then because even here in Montreal, I'm looking for others who have done this, you know, and I, and I haven't seen it. And one of the things too, is that we've throughout the evolution of these students that come through the project, then they leave. And, and so I've find trying to find ways to support them as they leave and go into the community and, and to create theater on their own and start writing their own theater. Because when I get them, they're, you know, 13, 14, 15. So not really at the stage where they're gonna, you know, get out there and be independent. So you gotta foster that. And at first these kids, when they start, they, they some of them are, they're, they're angry that they're, they have sort of a, something that's different than the others or whatever. But a lot of them, by the time they leave and they're in 18, 19, 20, they now feel like they're advocates. They feel like, They've processed that experience. They've been supported during that transition within themselves of understanding who they are. We've really tried to help them reach their own, you know, absolute certainty that they have value. And in yeah. fact, their value is, is, is in some ways, I'm not going to be comparative, but more significant because they are at the forefront of a new change and, and hopefully changing the way people see a whole group of people. And, and, you know, uh, one of my students, Claudio Tamburi, he wrote a one-man show that last summer I, I directed for him. He wrote it. You know, I I just directed him. He was the one-man performer. It went to the Montreal Thin Fringe, the Toronto Fringe, had all sorts of support. And so that's a wonderful story of like, so I guess where you guys are at in some of these companies, you're out there producing, you, you are really taking control of, of your destiny. I'm sort of at the stage where these young people are sort of developing yeah yeah okay so i'm gonna uh again i'm going to reiterate that if anyone has any questions please post them to facebook live and we'll try to get those out but i have uh, a few questions i had come up with and honestly he, you've already kind of gone into a little bit of some of them in in minor detail but um i'm gonna i'm gonna um so um i'm going to start with um Obviously, you mentioned um, how you have students of many varying levels of ability. Um, so how, how, how do you go about engaging everyone together with so many different varying abilities? How do you, how do you get them to mold into a cohesive group? You know? That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked it. Um, we, I, I think, and I think part of that starts before I I even interact with them. It starts at the level of the school itself and what the school is. 
So the, the kids are not in classrooms based on diagnosis. They're in classrooms based on their, uh, you kind of look at, I mean, let's say you wanted to use age, you kind of look at age in three categories. You look at their biological age, you look at their, maybe their emotional uh, level, and then you look at their sort of, um, their sort of social levels. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that will place them into classes. So it's not just a strict grading. And, and in a class, there might be kids of different biological ages. So that, that mixing is already done at the school. So they are part of a larger social environment where they, and nobody's going around as a student thinking about diagnosis. It's just human being to human being. But the one thing I wanted to mention was you know, and you know, being a, a director of, of actors and I've, I've done shows that are all, you know, quote unquote neurotypical and, you know, there's not a huge difference. Like, I don't look at it like, okay, now I'm gonna do the play with the autistic students and I have to have a different mind. No, it's the same approach. But the big thing that's different, I find, is as you're saying, it's the point of engagement for theater, okay? because. A theater kid that's neurotypical, they're expressive, they're, you know, they're, they're engaging, they might be performative. There are so many incredible actors on the spectrum that day to day aren't like that. They're, they might be quiet, they might not be expressive, but then you have to see them on the stage. And when you put them in that environment, th tons of stuff changes. I had one student, his name was Gabriel, and he was like, you know, serious, relative serious day to day. If, if you did it, give him the time of day and you saw him walking down the hall, he was the funniest guy you've ever, I mean, and he would improv on this, on the stage. Yeah. He would just roll with it and riff. And his mom after the show, because he would have everybody, the audience and stitches, his mom after the show said, I never knew Gabriel was funny. Oh, and I'm okay. like, I yeah. never, I could, I could never, you know, I, that was, and so there's where you see we all have this other persona that comes out when we're on the stage. We all do. Yeah. But I find like trying to figure out who will be good on stage. That's the thing that's a little different. That's the thing where I think communities in general and people in general have to open up their audition process and make it more respectful of differences. They have to not expect everybody to come in and blow them away and, and feel okay about standing in a waiting room with a hundred other people. There has to be different ways of doing that part of the process because if you don't change the, that, if you don't open your mind up to just that first introduction, you're, gonna, you're, you're not gonna find these, these incredible individuals. You know, yeah. So that, that's sort of what, one of the differences I would say, but uh, yeah. So, um... So we have a question from Facebook Live. Um, so the question goes, uh, could you speak to the challenges, um, how you include uh, non-speaking or minimally speaking students um, and, and give any strategies that you might have found useful for that? Yeah, um, so for our school, we like, again, our school benefits from that sort of that mix of having many different capabilities. So I've had students that are, um, that are on stage, you know, non really nonverbal. Um, we often, what we try to do is pair them or, or create scenes where they can be with other performers that, that are, or so that we can sort of create environments. And I, I guess in my mind, uh, I'm also thinking of the students and so it's not just nonverbal. So maybe that's where I'm getting a bit, but I'm also thinking of the students that are, are very lower intellectually. A verbal, so, or, yeah. yeah. Exactly, where, where they can still be on stage, but they also, they, they need to sort of be bonded with someone else who, who can. And these wonderful, you know, sort of um, kinships on stage develop and it's a great thing to see. And, and it, it kind of speaks to the sort of group support that's happening on the stage as well, of mm -hmm. people supporting people. Um, so the non, you know, the other thing with nonverbal, it's, you know, it, be, because we create all our own content, mm -hmm. we're able to create content that would work for those students. So you have to say, okay, I'm going to put up a scene here where it's, there's not going to be speaking, you know, there's like in the first play that I did, there was really not much dialogue. A lot of the dialogue was was thought bubble dialogue that was sort of narrated by by another speaking person while the people on stage moved. 
So, you know, that's sort of part of the uh, part of it. So I guess if you can create um, scenes that have impact that are nonverbal, I think that's the key, right? And then so you can create wonderful moments that, that you know, there, there's still a lot that can be done on the stage with just presence, with movement, with, uh, with all of that. So, and that's sort of what we've, we've found is that we'll adjust the scene so that those individuals can be on stage. Um, and then you're seeing, you know, can they remember what to do to, to their movements and stuff? And that's the intellectual level. But yeah, for kids that are nonverbal there and with a higher intellect, there's a lot of opportunity as long as you, the facilitators or whoever is creating that piece um, recognizes that. Right. So we have about five, about five minutes left, uh, a little bit less now. Um, so I have two more questions. One uh, that I, I came up with and one that I, I was kind of thinking of, but that had been also asked on Facebook. Um, so we're going to ask them together. Um, what does the future hold for the summit school what, and your program within it? Um, what, what do you hope to be doing? And the other question being, how could people contact you and or the summit school if they want to become involved in your program? Okay, so I, I, I was speaking with Clay earlier in terms of, um, you know, Summit School, we have a website, it's changing soon. It's www.summit-school.com. So you start with that, um, but I'm also going to be providing to the uh, Spectrum Theater Ensemble all of my contact information yeah. and other ways of engagement. We have some documentaries and film things that, that we, can, we can kind of do engagements with so I think that's where I'll where I'll leave that and and I'll, and I'm Dan and and Clay obviously if people reach out to you guys wanting to know more we'll try to create that bridge of communication um, so that would be the first thing second thing uh, the future that is a you know that's it my idea for the future of the program has changed we had it we had a show planned for next February that might not happen now the thing is, I have also um, I also produce um, film also, so I think that is where I'm gonna kind of spend my my next project will probably be a film project with the students mm -hmm. because then we can deal with social distancing. We can deal with, mm -hmm. you know, the dissemination of that film it doesn't have to be in an auditorium. It could be on people's computers at home. So yes, do something like like what we're doing with Zoom. Absolutely, and, and I'm I'm getting a lot of inspiration from this. You guys are like, this is the I've done Zoom, but this your technical stuff is like the highest I've seen, man. You guys are pros, so I got to go learn all this stuff now so I can do it. But yeah, so you know, but beyond that, like forgetting about COVID and forgetting about um, you know, what we're going through now. I think the the key for me was just to continue to find interesting stories that will resonate with our student performers and will resonate with audiences to continue to kind of build what we're doing. We're all about original stuff. I, I just, I love, I love it when people do plays that have already been written, but I just have this feeling that the voice, you know, it, it, it's so interesting when it, everything's operating from the students to the message to everything. It's all new. It's all coming from this sort of unique perspective. Um, that's sort of what excites and interests us over here. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's the future for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, wow, Dan, thank you so uh, much. See, yep. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, so, we're, we're definitely looking forward to collaborating with you in the future um, yes. and with the program, the Summit School. Um, we're going to be cutting out for about five minutes while we get ready for our next um, panel, which, again, you'll see me again. So, um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank yep. you so much, Spectrum Theater Ensemble. Thank you, Dan. And just, it was great being here.